In Rojava, power is decentralized to the point where neighbors make most decisions that affect them in a body called a commune. This is nothing like a commune in the US. It is essentially a neighborhood assembly, made of 100 to 150 families or so, and instead of politicians deciding what norms should govern their community, they all do, through directly democratic structures. Each person living within the commune can represent themselves directly within the commune assembly. The commune is used on a principle that most of us know intrinsically. Nobody knows better what you and your neighbors need than you and your neighbors yourselves. Communes are linked together through elected and removable spokespersons, one woman and one man, to form a neighborhood council. And neighborhoods are linked to form city councils, and so on and so forth. This is a bottom-up or horizontal system of organizing society. The larger the area of administration a council has, the less power it has. For example, in the largest city in Jazeera Canton, Camislo, there is a neighborhood called Corniche. In Corniche, there are 58 communes. Of these communes, three are Assyrian and Armenian, three Arabic, and 52 Arabic and Kurdish mixed. These 58 communes from the, form the Corniche Neighborhood Assembly, but the heart of power remains in the individual communes themselves. Women and young people also can, and do, organize their own communes separately. The commune is made up of committees which residents can sign up for. To name a few, the Women's Committee, the Youth Committee, Healthcare Committee, Economic Committee, Safety Committee, Neighborhood Defense Groups, and Peace Committee, Transformative Justice says the first line of defense. In order to really understand how communes work, we have to go through the committees one by one. Economic Committee. Solve your problems yourself and do not wait for others to do it. Motto of Shekso Village, Kamishlo Countryside. A growing part of Rojava's economy is the cooperative. Cooperatives are democratically controlled by all of the participants, without control by bosses or state bureaucrats. Often in Rojava, it is participants of the communes who decide what cooperatives to open. This method might be even more representative than worker-owned cooperatives because the entire community, even beyond those who work at a business, are often affected by the decisions made by it, and here they too get a say. An economy based on participatory democracy instead of managerial feudalism encourages the consideration of factors beyond just money. A community is never going to vote to pollute their own neighborhood, for example. The current global economy allows people, especially CEOs and executives, to make the decisions that affect the lives of many, but avoid dealing with any of the consequences. The cooperative economy in Rojava is an antidote to this. I should stress that cooperatives have been much slower to develop than other structures of the revolution in Rojava. The Syrian regime for years imposed monocropping of wheat controlled by large landowners on the region, and Rojava's economy was dependent on other parts of Syria before the war. Since the war, the region has been under embargo from all sides, including from Turkey and the much more state capitalist oriented Kurdish regional government in Iraq. The economy before the war was also very much feudal. Unlike many radical revolutions, this one was not accompanied by massive expropriations of private lands or forced collectivizations. The revolutionaries in Rojava prefer a slow-going, voluntary building of a social economy from the ground up. Radical change, in their minds, is much longer lasting and more deeply rooted in society when it is done through building consensus with many sectors of society. This means face-to-face -face meetings, education and public service announcements, incentivizing cooperation, etc. Besides, many plots of lands have been owned by families, many of them Arabs, for generations and some sort of expropriation of these lands could lead to ethnic conflict, entirely contradictory to the democratic confederalist project of ethnic pluralism. Land and businesses possessed and worked by individuals and families is perfectly tolerated, in fact, guaranteed in the social contract. 
but cooperation is incentivized in a way similar to how large corporate entities are in the United States. These incentives range from subsidies, tax breaks, municipalities providing tools and machinery, trade and production cooperatives offering reduced prices, trade unions assisting with engineers and specialized workers, etc. Those who prefer to work within a more hierarchical or capitalist paradigm can do so. They may just have limited access to the communal economic network. The incentives have made a difference. Before the war, cooperatives were very rare in the region. Now, all cooperatives make up 7% of Jazeera Canton's economy alone, with cooperatives solely run by women making up 3% of the entire economy. There are 87 cooperatives in Jazeera Canton alone, comprising more than 30,000 participants, according to Hoar News. Kobane's cooperative section is even more advanced. No region of Rojava had more cooperatives than Afrin, but sadly, all of that has been lost thanks to Turkey and Salafist groups' invasion and occupation of Afrin earlier this year. However, refugees from Afrin immediately organize themselves into communes in their new homes and will carry their social economy with them. Cooperatives aren't limited to the cities, but are growing in the countryside too. If you will allow me to read an extended excerpt from cooperativeeconomy.info, the best source on cooperatives in Rojava. I think it will provide some valuable insight. Jarudie is located in the Barav region of Derek. The Shahid Kani commune includes an agricultural cooperative with 26 members. In the three-acre field, all cooperative members participate in the work. There are six groups with five members each. Every group works for one day, and every Friday all groups participate. The aim of the cooperative is to revive the communal and natural village livelihood. Accordingly, a common program has been made to carry out farming and irrigation, and things like that. The cultivated products are sold in the Derek market, and the revenue is distributed equally to all cooperative members. Children have also been involved in the activities. Going to the fields with their families, the children play with their peers in the spacious and communally cultivated fields. This village is an economic commune that decided democratically to communalize its economy. Most villages and cities in Rojava have a mix of social oriented and individually oriented economies. Many communes also pool money to provide a safety net for their members, reminiscent of that once provided to many Americans through fraternal organizations like the Lions Club, Odd Fellows, and similar organizations. For example, in the village of Shekso in Kamishlo, there is a common fund from which everyone can benefit on occasions such as illnesses, deaths, and weddings. This fund is mainly used by economically ill-posed residents in emergencies. As 80-year-old Mohamed Eli Kute told the Anha News Agency, all villagers pay monthly into the fund according to their financial resources. Finally, Communes also work like the bulk buying cooperatives that have been taking off in the US and the UK recently. The commune buys essential food products, sugar, salt, bulker, oil, bread, etc., and other important goods directly from producers and wholesalers for around 20 to 35% cheaper. If there are cooperatives that produce or trade in these goods, the cooperatives are favored. The commune also procures generators to create electricity for the households. 